Okay, so I think we'll get started. Great. So hi everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is Barry Reeves. I'm with Latin America Solidarity Committee in Corvallis and I'll be moderating uh, during uh, most of this event. As you can see from the title, um, we have two purposes in mind today. The first portion of the title, U.S. sanctions on Venezuela and Iran before and during COVID-19 will be addressed by our featured speaker, Dan Cavalli. The second part of our time together this afternoon is described as Pacific Northwest organizing for a humane policy. So during that time, our panelists um, will be speaking with you around this topic um, as we strategize about ways to move forward and collaborate with one another in the uh, Pacific Northwest region. I'll also mention that we intend to follow up this session fairly soon, perhaps within a week or two, with another Zoom meeting around uh, strategizing around how to collaborate with other groups within the region. So that'll be coming up in the future. Um, other panelists will speak to that toward the last half of the program. Our featured speaker today is lawyer and human rights advocate, Dan Kabalik. He'll be introduced by my colleague shortly. I want to give a shout out to our list of co-sponsors. We have a, should have a slide um, that lists them. Um, this list has burgeoned in the last week, and that's really heartening. Um, uh, let's see, Chris, can you pull up the slide, the sponsor slide? There we go. For the sake of uh, using, saving our time, I'm not gonna read this list, but I, if you see your name up there, give yourself a pat on the back and we appreciate uh, the support. I wanted to um, go over our panelists today. Jack Herbert is with PCAS. Uh, Portland Central America Solidarity Committee, Committee and Hands Off Venezuela, Portland. Cindy Domingo is board chair of LILO, Legacy of Equality, Leadership and Organizing, as well as Women's International League for Peace and Freedoms, Cuba and the Bolivarian Alliance Committee. Cindy's a longtime West Coast activist for Filipino rights as well as rights of women and workers and for economic and environmental justice. She's based in Seattle. And finally, Eleni Prata is executive director of Whatcom Peace and Justice Center in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, welcome to you all. So the structure for this hour and a half of our time together will include time for questions for both Dan Kavalik, our featured speaker, uh, and that time will be immediately after his talk. Also, there will be time for Q&A for the panelists uh, during uh, the last 15 minutes or so of our time together today. Um, when you do uh, uh, submit a question in the Q&A, if you could uh, address who you're addressing the question to, that makes it a bit more smooth for us. So finally, I would mention that we'll attempt to make this event as flawless as possible, uh, as I think we're all learning uh, within these platforms, there can be glitches that show up unexpectedly <laughs> for reasons that aren't always clear, and uh, we'll attempt to navigate them as best we can. So with that, I'll uh, hand it off to my colleague, Jack Herbert, to introduce our featured speaker. Hi. 
Uh, I should say that I'm also a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and they let men in as long as we don't try to run things. So we're here today because we found community with and for all of us to be the way of life that works for us and society. And our community has been attacked and weakened by the forces driving domination and exploitation as the ways that rule us on our planet and are heading us for destruction. So we know that we need to arouse our people to be a people together so their will to community is always directing us on this planet in order that life can be humane, livable, sustainable. Um, we've allowed these forces for domination and exploitation to gather so much wealth and power that we're attacked in so many ways. And as we organize to fight many issues, we divide up and none of us has enough to enough uh, enough of us together to succeed. Some of us have been working to free Latin Americans from the U.S. government. We've gotten together a little to bring speakers in the Northwest. The immigrant and climate movements have gathered better, but we all need to come together to be one movement, so that we can attract our people and the, to to join us. We need more. We need all of us together, and then we need to attract our public, and then we can succeed. The United States government is the tool of the corporate military complex, driving worldwide domination to open all people's lands, waters to exploitation, to gather more wealth and power, which they then use to buy control of the government so they can keep on, they can just expand and expand. The United States government has many means to subjugate peoples, align with up, local upper classes to exploit the people. The people re who resist, it attacks. There are many ways, sanctions and other economic means, military, propaganda, internal sabotage to arouse coups, and so on. And so today we're gonna hear about attacks on the peoples of Venezuela and Iran, the suffering it brings, all authorized by the people we elect. And in particularly the extreme suffering that they are now opened up to with COVID-19. Our speaker, Dan Kovalik, has researched and written five books on these ways the United States government attacks peoples. His new one just out is No More War, How the West Violates International Law by Using Humanitarian Intervention, so-called, to Advance Economic and Strategic Interests. Dan is a professor of international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He was Associate General Counsel for the United Steel Workers for 25 years. He was, he's widely known as one of the best leading defenders of Colombian union members against all the attacks on them. I should remember that, note, remember that Colombia is the United States biggest recipient of aid in Latin America. And it's where democracy should be the greatest if our aid were really doing, doing what we thought, we think it should be for. It's doing the opposite. And Dan has been in there fighting them and, and every step of the way that he can. And so he, he is uh, in the United States, he has brought lawsuits against Coca-Cola, uh, Drummond, Occidental Petroleum uh, under the, the Alien Tort Claims Act. So he will be speaking about the detrimental effect of our sanctions and, and on these countries facing the brunt of U.S. aggression in this time when, when we all need to cooperate to acquire medicine and equipment necessary to fight COVID-19. And so he says, in, in quite a time when the world needs international solidarity more than ever, U.S. is is weaponizing the virus to punish country, these countries. So without more ado, I'll say, turn it over to Dan. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thank you for everyone uh, on this call. I'm very grateful that people would take time out on the Sunday during a pandemic to talk about U.S. sanctions against Iran and Venezuela. I saw at least one steel workers on the line. I want to give a shout out to you. I worked for the steel workers for almost 26 years. Very good um, career for me, and I'm very grateful to the steel workers. Also, just to give you a little 
a uh, little background. I do have some connections to the great Northwest. I lived in Seattle for a little bit after college in the er, in 1989. And, uh, I also went to high school and played football with a guy named Ken Griffey Jr. who played with the Seattle Mariners for a time. So um, in any case, it's great to talk to all of you and to focus on what's happening with sanctions against these countries. Um, I had actually a pretty great – experience on Friday. At the last minute, I was asked to be on a video conference with President Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela. And uh, I was able to uh, to hear him speak. I was able to speak to him over Venezuelan TV as well. Um, incredibly, Venezuela is doing about as well or better than any country in Latin America combating this pandemic. As of yesterday, the statistics were that they had about uh, 345 positive cases of coronavirus and 10 deaths, which compared to other Latin American countries is incredible. And how were they able to do this? I mean, they jumped on this immediately, even before they had one confirmed case they started shutting down international travel. And then once they had confirmed cases, they started shutting down businesses and engaging in a voluntary lockdown. And President Rodero made it clear that it was voluntary, but about 90% of the country is following that in Venezuela, uh, which is incredible, you know? And so, we have to applaud their success. But in the meantime, we do have to recognize how sanctions are um, strangling their ability to deal not only with the the pandemic, but with other diseases. So um, for those who aren't aware of it, uh, the Center for Economic Policy Research um, did a study fairly recently, a report done by two economists that included Mark Weisbrot and Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University. You ever heard of Goldman Sachs? He's the Sachs, okay? So he's a pretty, you know, mainstream guy. Um, They concluded that between uh, 2017 and 2018, 40,000 Venezuelans died due to the U.S. sanctions. 40,000, and they predicted that more would die in the next year, 2019, but no, those figures haven't come out. And how did they come up with this? Pretty simple. They looked at the medicines that Venezuela could not get due to sanctions, and those included uh, HIV medicine, uh, chemotherapy medicine, insulin for diabetes um, and uh, dialysis equipment. Um, And they, based on their determination on how many people were using or needed those drugs and equipment, determined that at least 40,000 people died in a one-year period, that more would die in the year after. Uh, You know, very much in corroboration of this, UN expert, Dr. Alfred Desaius, a great guy uh, who will talk to any, any press outlet that will give him time. But of course, no mainstream people will. He, he estimated at least 100,000 Venezuelans have died due to U.S. sanctions. And so these sanctions are killing uh, Venezuelans. And, and they're intended to. They're intended to, to, to cause suffering amongst the target countries. You know, um, the idea is you inflict as much suffering on the people of a country like Venezuela with the hope that they then basically cry uncle and then overthrow their government. That's the whole point of this. 
And um, so far, they haven't overthrown their government, but they are suffering. And we see the U.S. trying various means now to overthrow the government, even during a pandemic, which I have to emphasize that. You know, we all know, everyone on this call knows, our own government has done a terrible job in dealing with this pandemic, right? Our president waited at least six weeks before even calling it a pandemic and dealing with it, right? Um, the measures that have been passed have largely benefited the rich. Up to date, you know, a meager $1,200 have, have been given to working class people. Um, there are unemployment benefits available, but at last I saw 70% of workers in this country entitled to unemployment have yet to receive benefits. So um, we can't take care of our own people. But in, even in the midst of that, we're spending money and resources to attack other countries during this pandemic. So I, the news of today, for example, was that the Venezuelan military intercepted eight mercenaries who tried to overthrow the, US, the Venezuelan government today. Uh, one of them admitted to being a U.S. DEA agent. You know, so this was clearly a U.S. government operation. Uh, meanwhile, there have been reports in very mainstream media um, that a former Green Beret had also led uh, an attempted coup against the Venezuelan government uh, some months ago. And of course, as we know, uh, many former military folks are being used as mercenaries by the U.S. government. So the U.S. is still actively trying to overthrow the current government in Venezuela. Even during this pandemic, you probably know the U.S. has sent warships to the Caribbean um, to intercept various um, uh, ships to and from Venezuela, including, by the way, um, ships from Mexico, which are bringing necessary food to Venezuela. The U.S. is trying to block um, Mexico's um, uh, food support for Venezuela. So, you know, all of this is, is, is really calculated to bring as much suffering to these people as possible. And the fact, frankly, that the Venezuelan government has survived this long, despite all these attacks, shows, frankly, how much popular support they have. In addition to the sanctions, it's really important to talk about uh, the, what can I say, naked acts of robbery and theft against the Venezuelan people. So uh, earlier in 2019, the U.S. government literally stole Venezuela's U.S. oil and gasoline company known as Citgo. You probably have all seen Citgo stations um, from Venezuela. They just stole it from them and took all the assets of that company, which total billions of dollars. And uh, news reports from the last week say that the U.S. has given around $350 million of those uh, seized assets to the U.S.'s puppet in Venezuela, Juan Guaido, who then turned around and is paying his people $5,000 a month in Venezuela, which is an incredible amount of money uh, by Venezuelan standards, um, to continue his opposition activities in that country. And if you look at the polls, and again, go to mainstream sources, and you can Google this, 
Juan Guaido has virtually no support in Venezuela, amongst the Venezuelan people. Even amongst the opposition, he doesn't have support. Um, this is a guy handpicked by the United States to uh, represent U.S. interests in Venezuela, in particular U.S. oil interests. He's been very open about that, that if he became president of Venezuela, he would privatize uh, Venezuelan oil, which is now nationalized, and he would open it up to international exploitation, meaning mostly U.S. Uh, exploitation and investment. Um, and that's really what this intervention is about in Venezuela, as it is in Iran as well, of course. Is there a coincidence that, uh, you know, these two big uh, coup operations that are happening right now, again, even during a pandemic, are against two of the major oil producers on earth, Venezuela, which I think some of you or most of you know has the largest known oil reserves on earth, and Iran, which has some of the largest oil reserves on earth. And so the U.S. is trying to regain control over those oil reserves, which it controlled at various times um, in history, and we can talk more about that. So meanwhile, Iran has been suffering as well from U.S. sanctions. They have been denied medicines as well, not just for uh, COVID-19, but for numerous other uh, ailments, and they have been denied medicines to, uh, for um, uh, transplants as well. Children have died. We've known children in Iran have died. They've been un unable to get transplants and other medicines uh, there due to these sanctions. Um, and, you know, it's quite interesting. Meanwhile, again, similar to what's happening with Venezuela, where the U.S. has sent warships there, the U.S., of course, it always has warships in the Persian Gulf, but Trump has become more bellicose about his threats against Iran, saying if they molest U.S. ships there, he would attack those ships. Um, he clearly is ginning for some sort of war with Venezuela and or Iran, and frankly, hoping to use the pandemic to do that. In Iran, you know, it's not clear how many people will die from the pandemic, but the government there estimated that literally millions could die uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and again, largely because of these sanctions, which have prevented them um, from treating their own people. Um, and that is just unconscionable, obviously. You know, all of us have to um, agree that to sanction these countries during a pandemic is not only immoral, but illegal. And in fact, uh, the U United Nations Secretary General has called for sanctions to end during this pandemic as has the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. The Pope has called for sanctions also to end during this time. You know, uh, basically leaders with any decency have said you can't continue to sanction countries during a pandemic and you can't continue to carry out actions of war. During a pandemic, the UN Secretary General said that as well. There should be an end of hostilities during this time. Obviously, all of us on this call would agree we should end those uh, uh, hostilities anytime and for all time. Um, but the fact that you have the UN calling for that is quite significant. Uh, 
Um, and I think it, it, it's important to point out how the U.S.'s conduct during this pandemic contrasts so greatly with countries like Cuba and China. But in particular, let's talk about Cuba. So the U.S. has ratcheted up sanctions against Cuba, too, during this pandemic. It has, in fact, uh, actively prevented um, respirators from getting to Cuba during this pandemic. Uh, meanwhile, what is Cuba doing? It's sending doctors to 31 different countries to fight the pandemic. It is sending equipment and it's sending a drug that it produced in its own laboratories that have been used successfully against the pandemic. Um, in China used that drug, so did Italy. You know, Italy announced that they were abandoned effectively by the EU. And um, they said that they had to turn to China and to Cuba for help, and they got that, that help. So it's kind of an, an incredible thing that a country as small as Cuba that's been under a U.S. blockade now for about 60 years, can also support countries during this pandemic. As they supported Haiti uh, during the cholera outbreak after the 2010 uh, earthquake. And it's that sort of solidarity that you know, is being demanded, I think, of all countries at this time. Again, even Pope Francis talked about that, that we need this international solidarity to come together and fight this pandemic. Instead, the U.S. is going the other way. The U.S. brought every single Peace Corps volunteer back from abroad to the U.S. and has interfered with various countries' ability to get protective equipment and respirators, even basically stealing it from them um, to bring it here to the U.S., is sanctioning now about 35 different countries, hampering their ability to deal with this pandemic, while other countries, again, I think notably uh, Cuba and China and Russia as well, um, are sending doctors and supplies to other countries, including the United States. China and Russia have both sent equipment and supplies to the U.S., um, even as the U.S. vilifies those countries. So, you know, the upshot is that these sanctions against these countries are illegal. Only the Security Council of the United Nations has the legal power to order economic sanctions against countries in the interests of international peace and security. No nation, including the U.S., can do that unilaterally, and yet the U.S. is doing that right now. Again, not only against Iran and Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua, but against about a total of 35 different countries. It has no power legally to do that. And uh, we need to resist this. Uh, we need to call for international solidarity, uh, not just in the interest of other countries, but in the interest of our own. Uh, our own government has obviously proven unable and incapable to um, and unwilling to defend its own citizens against this pandemic. Um, and we need to be open to working with other countries um, uh, to fight it. So that's really my, my, the thrust of, of, of my ideas. And I'm happy to take questions, comments.
Yeah, so Dan, I have a series of questions here. Okay, great. This is Barry, so we're going to start at the top, and there's some very good questions that have been submitted. Um, this is a long uh, question. I'll try to condense it down. Um, a friend had visited Nicaragua twice. The first visit, um, he came back uh, seems seemingly supporting Nicaragua's aims. After the second visit, he came back critical of Nicaragua, uh, Venezuela, and Maduro. And seemingly on this second visit, he was influenced by something called the color revolution perspective. So the questioner is asking if you could speak to the color revolutionaries. And his question is, do they, the color revolutionaries, support the opposition? Are they CIA, USAID? So that's the thrust of the question. Okay. And I'm happy with that question. He came to the right place. <laughs> I happen to know a lot about that situation, a lot about Nicaragua. Um, I've been there a bunch of times, re very recently. And a lot of, first of all, I got a few statistics for you. Okay. Uh, the UN, at the end of, I believe it was 2018, ranked Nicaragua fifth in the world for gender equality. Fifth. And the four top countries were, you know, Scandinavian countries, not surprising, right? Um, Meanwhile, Nicaragua is nearly 100% food sovereign. That means that nearly all the food they eat, they grow themselves. They are considered the safest country in Central America, the most stable and the most prosperous. And one proof of that is that, you know, when you look at the people who are migrating from Central America to the U.S., uh, even according to our own immigration authorities, Nicaragua is almost uh, 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 is supplying almost none of these migrants because, again, they have a pretty stable uh, country to be in. Um, the group that has been most influential, I believe, this, if you're talking about color revolutions in, in Nicaragua in particular, the group that is most influential in the U.S. is known as the MRS, the Sandinista Reformation Movement. And they are definitely trying to push the idea that the FSLN, the Sandinista Front, is this sellout party. And, um, you know, they've been supporting, in fact, U.S. sanctions against Nicaragua. Well, the interesting thing about the MRS, in addition to the fact they supported the NECA Act, which cuts Nicaragua off from all international financing, despite the fact they were using that financing for poverty reduction and social programs. And I cite uh, the World Bank and the IMF for that idea. Um, the other thing about the MRS is that for since their beginning until this time, they poll in terms of support amongst the Nicaraguan people at about 1.5%, 1.5%. I mean, you could probably find, you know, a Satanist organization in the U.S. that got 1.5% support, right? I mean, it's a joke that people are listening to this MRS uh, movement. And Democracy Now! is, is one outlet that has their... Uh, spokespeople on all the time and they have no popular support in Nicaragua 
Um, but they've done a great job at getting a lot of support in the West, particularly in the U.S. And so I would say that one should be very critical of what they are saying. You know, right now, again, the latest poll I saw from, what is it, M, M and S, I think, consulting a very mainstream polling agency, is that if a vote were taken today, Daniel Ortega, uh, the Sandinista leader, would be reelected with over 52% of the vote. Um, and I think that's what people have to look at. You know, he's very popular. Um, and for good reason, because of what he has done uh, for that country. Thank you. I'm going to attempt to consolidate two questions into one because they both have a medical uh, subtext. Um, so one is has to do with um, where can we find documentation that verifies which medications are being blocked due to U.S. sanctions? And the second question, I think, refers to your comments around COVID-19 in Venezuela. And it says, Dan, how is testing and contact tracing going, um, I presume, in Venezuela during the pandemic response? Okay. So in terms of the medicines, at least in terms of Venezuela, uh, Iran, I, I, I don't know as much about. In terms of Venezuela, the best report on the medicines they are not getting is being done by the Center for Economic Policy Research, other, not, otherwise known as CEPR. So go to their website and you will find um, the report by Mark Weisbrot and Jeffrey Sachs, which details the medicines uh, that Venezuela is not getting. Um, in terms of testing and contact tracing in Venezuela, you know, I think uh, the testing um, and the contact tracing are probably not as good as they could be because of these sanctions. You know, it's very hard for them to get tests and it's very hard for them to, you know, have the capability to do contact tracing. What they have been able to do effectively is to um, really encourage effectively social distancing so that 90% of the country is honoring what amounts to, you know, a, a lockdown of, of the country. But I think in terms of testing and contact tracing, that is not where they're um, quite effective. Um, and again, I think sanctions are really hampering that. All right, thank you. The next question uh, has to do with a comparison of the effect of sanctions during the 1970s versus now. And the uh, concluding question is, how do we talk about sanctions in a way that makes the working class give a damn? I presume that's American working class. Well, so if you're tank talking about sanctions during the 70s, I assume you're talking about sanctions against Nicaragua in particular. I mean, Cuba as well, possibly. Um, I mean, I think the big difference now, of course, is that we have a pandemic. So the, that the sanctions, particularly as they impact medical uh, supplies and drugs um, are much more deadly and effective against uh, these countries. 
And of course, you know, these countries do not have, let's face it, the support of the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991. In the 70s, countries like Cuba and Nicaragua, yes, they were impacted greatly by U.S. sanctions, but they could get help from the Soviet Union, which was pretty, um, you know, open to doing that. And they're still getting some support from Russia and China, but I think not on that level that they got in the 70s. So I think sanctions now, you know, have a much uh, bigger impact on these countries than they might have had in the 1970s. What was, uh, you had a second part to that question. Well, what was that? Yeah, the second part had to do with uh, how do we talk about sanctions in a way that make working class makes the working class give a damn? Well, I think there's a few things. I mean, one is that I think you know most workers anywhere, including here, have compassion for other workers in other countries. So you first start with the fact that, look, workers just like you um, are not getting medicines and food and, and equipment they need to survive. I mean, that should be, you know, the first message uh, sent to people. But it also works the other way. Again, apparently Cuba has a drug that is effective at fighting uh, the coronavirus. They also claim to have a, uh, a drug that is effective at fighting lung cancer. You know, so the point is that in addition to the fact that, you know, the U.S. is hurting workers in, in other countries by these sanctions, they're hurting workers here because we cannot get those medicines from places like Cuba that could be helping our own people right now. You know, Cuba has offered to send doctors to the U.S. on numerous occasions, including during the uh, Katrina uh, hurricane in, in New Orleans. Um, you know, and th that was rejected, that offer. Um, we could be, our own workers could be helped by Cuba's medical uh, system. But we are being denied this by these sanctions, and I think people need to know that. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, you touched on uh, an issue that's part of another question. The question is, is the drug you mentioned that Cuba is providing to other countries, including China and Italy, called interferon alpha-2, uh, interesting that it's not mentioned here. I know a little yes. bit about that. Because... That is the drug. That is the drug. Yes. And apparently it's been very effective. I mean, apparently it helped China quickly get through their crisis and it helped Italy as well. You know, and we cannot get that drug here because of the blockade. There was, there has been recently an online petition uh, asking for this drug to be entered into the stream of um, evaluation um, in the regulatory process. And there's uh, apparently um, uh, some movement to do that so that that's addressing that question. thank you yeah that would be great i mean i support that uh let's see our next question um can you talk about the u.s history of quote ownership end quote of oil reserves in Venezuela and Iran. Yes, so um, both of uh, that ownership interest in both countries originates with Britain. So uh, the UK 
in the early 20th century controlled Venezuela's uh, oil, um, oil, all of their oil industry. And pretty early in the 20th century, the U.S. essentially took over that uh, control for itself. So for about 100 years, the U.S. controlled and profited from Venezuela's oil, you know, through companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron and Chevron's predecessors as well. Um, so for a hundred years, the U.S. really um, dominated Venezuela as an oil republic. You know, we talk about banana republics. Venezuela was an oil republic until Hugo Chavez was elected there in 1998. And he would eventually nationalize Venezuela's oil. And, and that's what really upset the U.S. And, and com you know, companies like Exxon and Chevron and the Koch brothers as well want that oil back. Uh, Iran is similar. Uh, Britain um, controlled Iran's oil from the very early 20th century until about 1951. At that point, the um, Iranian government through Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh nationalized Iranian, uh, Iran's oil. This is what led Britain to want to overthrow Mossadegh. But very quickly, Mossadegh got wise to Britain's plan and they th he threw all the British out of Iran so they couldn't pull that off so they went to the US to um, to overthrow Mossadegh for them very interestingly and I have a book on Iran by the way the plot to attack Iran I go into detail uh, about this mostly based on CIA uh, documents um, that detail this coup in Iran. At first, uh, Britain went to President Truman to overthrow Mossadegh. And Truman was like, hey, I, I'm not really interested in protecting Britain's oil interest in Iran. Bye bye. You know, I, I don't care. Go away. So, two things happened. So it was the labor government of Britain that went to Truman, okay? But then Churchill is reelected. Uh, I think it was in 51, okay? And then Churchill, he makes another run at the U.S. He goes to Eisenhower this time. He's a little better prepared. And he says, um, you know, we need to overthrow Mossadegh because he's a communist threat which was not true. But Eisenhower, he was open to that line of argument. And so the U.S. overthrew Mossadegh in 1953. And then the U.S. at that time, because they were the ones that did it, took over most of the oil reserves in Iran. Britain got a little piece, which became British Petroleum, the French got a little piece, but the U.S., which, you know, frankly did the, you know, uh, yeoman's job of overthrowing Mossadegh, got, I think it was like 80% of the oil reserves in Iran, which they would control until 1979 when the Islamic Re Revolution happened. And so both of these countries have been vassals uh, at various times of the U.S., and, you know, largely because of their oil um, reserves, but not only because of that. But, but that's been the primary interest. Thank you. I'm going to consolidate a couple of questions here. One has to do with uh, how do we develop solidarity within our movement? 
uh, amongst the various components of our movement for justice around foreign policy. And the other way of stating that, what top three actions would you encourage us to take as individuals that would make the biggest impact for ending sanctions as soon as possible? Well, that is always the biggest question. So, and I, I do have some ideas um, about this. Again, I think, you know, the idea that again, particularly during this pandemic, this is a very good time to argue and to lobby our Congress in particular to end the sanctions in light of a worldwide pandemic. It's affecting everyone. Uh, you know, you, you can quote the Pope and you can quote the UN Secretary General. You can quote the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights. I mean, you have a lot of very significant people who have come out on this issue and said, this is just not right. You know, and I think that is, you know, what you can do to lobby your legislators to oppose these sanctions. Uh, at the same time, not just in terms of sanctions, you know, the idea that we are spending over a trillion dollars a year on our military, even during a pandemic, is inexcusable. We need to pressure our Congress to stop that. You know, to me, one of the greatest symbols of this crazy priority that the U.S. has in terms of military uh, support versus supporting our own people, for example, is that the U.S., you know, as all of us know, has not gotten protective gear to our health care workers has not gotten respirators to our hospitals, has not gotten guaranteed income and health care to our workers. But what it has been able to do is spend $60,000 an hour to fly the Blue Angels over cities to thank health care workers for their work. It's insane. How do we have money for that? And not money for these other things, but we know why, because we have built a, a country uh, of war and of death. And um, that is what we need to make clear to our fellow citizens and to our, um, our government at this time. And I think it is a very good time to make that point during this pandemic. All right, thank you. Here's a question about South Africa. What about USA sanctions against South Africa? I'm not sure what the context of that question is, but. Yeah, I, I must admit that I don't know the current state of sanctions against South Africa. I do know that the U.S. is trying to convince South Africa not to accept Cuban doctors. Um, I do know that. They're trying to, you know, strong arm many countries not to accept Cuban doctors, um, which, of course, again, uh, why wouldn't people uh, accept those doctors? And I think we need to be reminded at this time in terms of that issue what Cuba did to help liberate South Africa from apartheid. And again, that goes a little beyond my discussion, but if you uh, read my book, the latest one, No More War, I do talk about that issue. Cuba has been very critical in supporting, you know, the South African liberation movement uh, for decades. And I think, you know, sending doctors there now is part and parcel of that. And they have every every right to to accept those doctors. Thanks. This is a bit of a lengthy question, Dan. I'm going to read it. 
Can you talk about China's relationship to countries in the global south affected by sanctions? Do you believe in CPP-NPA-NDF classification of China as, quote, social imperialist, or give credence to the perspective on imperialism rooted in global value flows argued by the likes of Ali Qadri? Okay, that's a great question. And, you know, I, first of all, I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on Chinese um, uh, imperialism to the, you know, or imperialism in quotes without, you know, conceding it is imperialism. But what I'll say is the following. I believe my own personal opinion is that China represents an important counterweight to U.S. imperialism and that to the extent China is imperialist, what I would say is that they are able to get what they need in terms of resources and labor in third world countries by building hospitals and railroads and by giving aid as opposed to bombing like the U.S. does. So my, my own view is that whatever China is doing in the world to represent its own interests is much more benign than the United States. That, I mean, I guess that's the extent of my view. And they're certainly helping countries like Iran and Venezuela and other countries under sanctions to survive. And I give them a lot of credit for that. They're also helping the U.S., you know, with masks and respirators. I mean, um, you know, I'll just say this. What comes to mind is, is this conversation that apparently Donald Trump had with Jimmy Carter. Trump called Jimmy Carter about China. And, um, you know, what are we going to do about China? He said. And Jimmy Carter said, look, uh, what I see is that China is building speed trains in its own country and elsewhere. He said, where, is you, where are your speed trains, Donald Trump? And he said, China is doing well because you know what? They're not spending money on the military. They're spending it on these other things like speed train. So Carter's point was, you know, maybe you should take a lesson from that, from China. And I think that's a valid lesson. Um, this is a follow-up question in regard to South Africa. USA sanctions were useful in ending apartheid in South Africa. Are sanctions always inhumane? I believe that that question is based on a factual inaccuracy. The U.S. never sanctioned South Africa. There were individual, how do I put it? There were grassroots movements in the U.S. to divest, and disinvest from South Africa that helped end apartheid. The United States was not part of that, right? Ronald Reagan engaged in what he called constructive engagement with South Africa. And what that meant was nothing, right? It meant basically supporting the apartheid government. There were effective movements in the U.S. and Europe and other countries to disinvest and divest from South Africa financially. You know, students protested to get universities to do that, other companies. Uh, there was the whole thing, don't play Sun City. You know, don't go to Johannesburg and give a concert. But that was not 
an act of the U.S. government. The U.S. government, let's be clear, supported the apartheid government till the end. It was grassroots movements, and it was the Cuban military, backed by the Soviet Union, that were more important to help end apartheid than anything else, you know. So um, the U.S. does not sanction countries to end apartheid or to end human rights infractions, you know. And I think, again, I don't want to be too self-promotional about my book, but that's the whole thing I talk about in this book, No More War, talks about the fact that, you know, our idea that the U.S. is sanctioning countries to support human rights or humanitarian goals is simply false. It's a false belief. It has no basis in fact. The next question is, can you briefly touch on what you learned from Maduro in your recent video call with him? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I learned about the numbers. Again, that the, that the numbers in Venezuela in terms of infections and deaths by the coronavirus are very low due to what they are doing um, in that country to fight that pandemic. But the other thing I learned from him is not so much statistics or facts, but what struck me about that encounter. So it was, it was very much a video conference like the one we're having now. And there are people from all over the world, but also, there were leaders of unions, Venezuelan unions, in the room with him. And they were able to ask Maduro any questions they wanted, uh, uh, particularly about the pandemic. And he addressed them. And he was very kind and he was very patient because many of the union leaders not just asked questions, they made speeches. I don't know if anyone has ever encountered such a thing. You know. um, can you imagine a U.S. president meeting with unions on a public forum and hearing their questions and answering their questions? It's very hard for me to even conceive of. You know, but, you know, he is a worker, worker president. He was a bus driver in a union before he entered the Chavista government, you know? And so he's very comfortable with that room. He's very comfortable with workers and union people. And that, more than the statistics, is what struck me, is that they have a president that is a worker and that cares about workers, cares about unions, and will sit down on national TV and have an open discussion with that. Thank you. Thank you. So the last question, uh, looks like the last question we haven't gotten to, we still have about seven minutes or so in this section. Um, given, the, given the diversity of theories of imperialism and interpretations of China's system, Quote, that's one hell of a false dilemma. And I'll throw in one kind of curveball here. Um, I wonder if you could speak to uh, China's treatment of Tibet. And um, full disclosure, in 1959, at the time of Cuba's revolution, was precisely the time that China invaded Tibet. <laughs> and uh, full disclosure, I practice Tibetan Buddhism. And I've been to Tibet last summer, and I, many of my friends are Tibetans. So I wonder if you could just address that. 
Well, okay. Full disclosure is I'm more, you know, my sympathies always, you know, lie more closely with the Soviet Union than China in the, you know, Sino-Chinese split. Um, so I'm not here to defend China. Um, what I will say is that, you know, every country has its territorial issues, as China has had with Tibet and Taiwan. Um, and they've tried to protect those. And I don't think they've done that as a matter of being socialist, but as a matter of being a nation, you know, which for all the good and bad a nation is. But also, at least as I understand it, from people like Michael Perenni, who's a huge mentor of mine, is that, you know, Tibet was not exactly a paradise when China intervened. That is to say, and even the Tibetan leaders, um, like, the, like the Dalai Lama and his predecessors, you know, they... Um, kind of ran a, a, a serfdom in Tibet, and, and China reversed that. Um, I'm not convinced that Tibet's much worse off after that than they were then. In fact, they may be better off. But, um, again, to me, that's, you know, to me, it's like, well, I'll give you a little thing. In fact, you mentioned an issue that I think is, is just happens to run into uh, one of my favorite books um, by Jean Brickmont, and it's called Humanitarian Imperialism. And Jean Brickmont says, you know, he talks about in particular bumper stickers in the U.S. that say free Tibet. And he's like, who's your audience? Who do you want to free Tibet when you put that bumper sticker on your car? The point being, like, whatever I think about Tibet or you think about Tibet, it's irrelevant. You know, I don't have any, I don't have any a say over Chinese foreign policy or Chinese domestic policy, however you define the, the Tibet issue. As a moral actor, I can only impact, you know, my own country, which at least up till now is ostensibly democratic, right? And so as a moral actor, I can, I can maybe impact what the U.S. is doing. And what's happening between China and Tibet, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I can do about that. And, and I think it's complicated, uh, is my own view. So. Um, I would say, in terms of Tibet or any other issue, read Parenti, read Michael Parenti. That's, and by the way, if, if you don't leave this conversation without, you know, anything else, but you decide to read Michael Parenti, I will consider this a huge uh, uh, success. Thank you. Um, Final comment as a as a, an appreciation about your comments in regard to sanctions um, towards South Africa. Um, so that's a uh, kudos to you for that explanation. So I think we've covered uh, pretty you. much all of the questions that were submitted. A total of it looks like sixteen. Yeah. That's amazing. And again, I appreciate that participation. Uh, again, on a Sunday afternoon uh, during a pandemic. That's great. All right. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we're at the point in our uh, time together where we can turn this over to Cindy Domingo. So I'm going to mute myself and uh, all right, it's up to you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you, Dan, for your presentation and answering all the questions and answers. I think we've been all around the world. 
uh, yeah. addressing uh, many, many issues, including the most important one around sanctions and the inhumanity of sanctions to the people of the world. And thank you, Barry, for doing an excellent job of moderating and, and the audience for great questions. Uh, it certainly deepened my understanding uh, a lot about sanctions and uh, many issues that I've thought about. So I, I just want to add to the discussion uh, about Cuba and the question about the interferon and Cuba's um, uh, long-time assistance to countries in terms of the addressing of healthcare as a human right to the people uh, to the people of the world. There is a campaign that's ongoing that was just launched this past week. It's called Saving Lives, and you can go to uh, www.savinglives.us-cubanormalization.org, and I put it in the chat box. Uh, if you are interested in participating in this campaign, uh, when we talk about, um, you know, uh, Dan already addressed that, you know, what, what do we have at stake as U.S. peoples, especially in this time of the pandemic? We need every resource we can to, to conduct this battle against COVID-19. And we see in this country that we are being deprived of many resources, including um, researchers and healthcare workers that Cuba is more than willing to send, that as Dan said, sent to Italy, uh, uh, sent to China, and a number of other countries that have asked for Cuba's help in, in battling COVID-19. They, they are ready and willing, uh, if there's an invitation by the United States, to come to this country to help us. Interferon Alpha 2B has been proven to, it is not a vaccine, that it has been proven in some of the most difficult cases uh, and helps to build the immune system. And so what we're trying to do is get the F FDA to conduct trials in this country of the use of, for the use of interferon alpha 2B. And, but that would require an override of um, the blockade that has been in existence for 60 years. But it would not be the first time that Cuba, that there has been testing going on, and the FDA has, can do that under an emergency situation. So it is a very important step we can do to, to tear down that blockade. And it's all the more so important during this battle against the pandemic. And I, I do want to say, one of the reasons we wanted to do this forum was because this pandemic calls into question uh, that we need cooperation amongst the peoples of the world. It will not be, we, we will not return to the same normal because the world has changed and people realize that we need international cooperation, not sanctions, not war, in order to deal with climate change, in order to deal with pandemics, in order to de deal with economic and social crisis. And everyone in this world has been impacted by this pandemic, which has been brought on, obviously, by climate change and the crisis that we're facing. And uh, while many of us did not realize, most of us did not realize that an economic crisis could happen overnight internationally. So, it's a new period, um, you know, while many of the, most of the people in the world, especially in the United States, are facing economic and social crisis, we've seen an ability for people to come together. And uh, this is the time in which people are questioning this system under neoliberalism, under capitalism, that something has to change qualitatively. And, um, you know, during the May Day celebrations, um, people have gone to the streets. They have found a way to safe distance. 
in order to create social solidarity, economic solidarity, to change, fundamentally change the way this system is operating, to fundamentally change the capitalist system. And so it's an opportunity. I think, you know, it took us a while to organize this. We've been in discussions with Dan for many months about doing this particular webinar, but little did we know that we would be doing it under this pandemic. And so, uh, as someone says, now is the time to come together as one group working together. And this next section, uh, and we hope the next webinar will focus on how we can concretely come together to build a movement in the Pacific Northwest to end all sanctions. And obviously, we need to end war. And um, in doing so, it would free up the resources that would create the safety net that we need in this country. Um, you know, over the last few years, uh, uh, the the word intersectionality has has been coined. Uh, many of us from the 60s and 70s knows knew what intersectionality was, but we didn't have the word intersectionality. Uh, but the world is much more complex now. It's not so easy for uh, some of us and young people to say, these are the bad guys, these are the good guys. The world is much more complex. The balance of forces are complex. But we do know that sanctions and war are bad. And sanctions and war have to end in order to meet the needs of people of the world and, and the needs of people in the United States. So I want to call on um, Aline, Alina to speak about some of the work that she's been doing great work in uh, in Whatcom, uh, if you saw the list of endorsers, a number of them came from Whatcom County. Uh, and uh, so I'd like her to talk about some of the work that she's been doing uh, there. Hi, Cindy, thank you so much for inviting me in and thank you to all the panelists for speaking on such an important topic today. Uh, thanks, Jack, for inviting me. We're definitely really proud to sponsor this conversation, right? And I just hope, um, just wanted to acknowledge for a second that I hope that this webinar is finding everyone, the participants and the um, and the panelists in good health. I know that many of us have family and friends in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, and I hope that this finds you all in good health. Um, like Cindy said, my name is Aline Prata. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am the director of the Watkin Peace and Justice Center since August of 2019. And I'm also a Brazilian immigrant. I uh, was born and raised in Brazil and organized there since, since I was a high schooler, since 2008, um, in a variety of issues, first on social environmental issues, um, agrarian reform and food sovereignty, and then transitioning into my work with the World March of Women and Live Unch Popular da Juventude, which is a youth um, uprising movement too. Um, I made my way to the Pacific Northwest in 2015, a little bit before the coup d'etat that uh, took democratically elected President Dilma Rousseff from power. Um, and at the same time that I got a scholarship opportunity to study at Western Washington University here in Bellingham. Uh, since then, it has been an interesting transition, right, to come from uh, super autonomous, global south, independent and poor on resources organizing into organizing in, you know, in a land in the eye of the hurricane, right, the, the belly of the beast, uh, and in a context of uh, nonprofits. So I want to acknowledge that there's a difference in that work and um, that there's like more different and more resources, more status and also more distractions like bureaucracy and policy that comes out of that. And we're all doing our best in trying to learn together how to unify those fronts and um, strengthening um, the solidarity and movement work that we need to build together um, to defund from wars and uh, create a future of peace and social justice. Um, I feel really, really fortunate to have found the Peace and Justice Center and to have found a home in this place uh, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, and I'll just uh, briefly mention two fronts, uh, three fronts in which the Peace and Justice Center works and three examples of what we've been doing here in Whatcom County. 
Um, but above all, I'm really excited about the fact that the Decent Justice Center works in uh, intersectional, uh, intergenerational, and anti-imperialistic framework. Um, and those are big words, but what basically that means is just pro-people, right? And understanding systems of oppressions and how, how they function together. Um, we also function on a framework of uh, solidarity and not charity. Uh, so we're really focused on sharing resources, uh, connecting people and connecting uh, resources and really functioning as a movement incubator, as a center, right? Instead of claiming that we are the movement in itself, we are a movement incubator in a way. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the center, I would really encourage you to take a look at our website. I'm plugging in a couple of links right here. Oh, I think only one went through, but a couple of links right here that are examples of the work that the center has been doing. And I'd encourage you to take a look at our website too, uh, whatcanpjc.org. Um, there's a variety of resources, talks like this one, and um, links and opportunities to stay connected with us and with our work. Um, we work primarily on three fronts, education, direct action, and community partnerships. Um, and the first example that I'll give is based on direct action, right? Uh, so earlier this year, like many of you, we organized um, um, action in, in solidarity with Iranian folks with the creeping in of the war on Iran and further aggressions uh, from the US. And we did that in a partnership with uh, Whatcom DSA and with Students United for Equal Palestinian Rights. Um, and once that ended, we, we had a talk about how just doing actions isn't enough. And how in, in Brazil, we've been talking a lot about how we need to stop letting the right and letting, um, yeah, letting the right and letting people in power define what is our agenda, define what the left is gonna be celebrating, struggling for. And, and I mentioned that earlier to Jack, and I think that that's one place that we really need to focus our energies in understanding how to not be reactive, but be smart about um, uniting all of these frameworks and exposing the contradictions within capitalism to, to bring us all together and to continue for the agendas and for the, the things that we were focused on and the work that we were focused on from the beginning, which is building base, building uh, consciousness, building solidarity and really def like defining and finding what solidarity really means, right? Um, so from that, we decided to continue to meet and, uh, and to educate ourselves together, take on that revolutionary task of learning with each other, right? And almost, um, and almost immediately this book, uh, Undoing Border Imperialism from Harsha Walia, um, came out in the promotion as like, um, from the, from their press, I would really recommend everyone to read it. And we decided to study it together, right? Like brought a lot of uh, Swana diaspora youth folks and Wacom DSA folks together and sat down and educated ourselves through popular pedagogy, popular education on what, what does border imperialism means? Like how do our fights and our struggles get to uh, like intersect? And what are we really fighting for? And what are uh, alternative alternatives and creative ways in which we can stand in solidarity with, with each other without that rush and the meritocratic um, practice that nonprofit, the nonprofit industrial complex uh, reproduces and um, puts into us when we're trying to do organizing work. How, what does it look to really build rela true, like relationships truly um, connected through trust, uh, shared political analysis, and like leaderships of folks who are impacted, right? And that has been a really, a really amazing opportunity. We also continue to build community partnerships through that and also through other projects that bring, you know, um, our elders of the peace movement and connect them with the, with the youth who are bringing so much energy and like revitalizing the anti-war movement now. Um, we have a project that will be launched pretty soon on, um, on, um, it, it's a storytelling uh, project, and I'll, I'll leave you with that, uh, where both youth and elders will get to share their accumuluses, like what they learn through their vivid experiences and what can we learn from each other and how can we build trust beyond where we're at. Um, but I'll share more about that. And uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Veterans for Peace who have been 
uh, who joined us are co-sponsors for this event and who have been fundamental in doing counter recruitment work in Whatcom County with us. We visit high schools at least twice per semester, build relationships with the youth and also propose alternatives to military service and say, and do truth in recruitment work. Um, shout out to Jean and to Stan and everyone there and to our com compañeros on Whatcom DSA who joined us for this uh, uh, webinar too. I see you, Ed. I see you, Dan. Um, I, I guess two other quick examples. Uh, we are co-signing and co-sponsoring a resolution with Whatcom DSA. Um, the link is in the in the chat right now um, for a mutual aid fundraising and also to call our con our members of Congress on uh, lifting sanctions to Iran, and uh, did a similar co-sponsorship with. Super, which is the Students United for Equal Palestinian Rights, who are raising funds for the Palestinian American Medical Association, um, and who will soon be um, be creating a week of webinars and uh, and ways to stay connected with Palestinian solidarity. So, yeah, please stay connected to our work, and shout out to to Super and to. Uh, and to welcome DSA and to everyone else who joined us on this panel and all the organizations. Oh, I guess one more, po more point that I wanted to do real quick, if I have a minute, is just to remember that this pandemic is a crisis, but it's really highlighting the crises that we've already been facing for a really long time. And it's important to remember that, right? Like we've already been in a crisis and a crisis of capitalism and a crisis of democracy and a crisis of patriarchy in a crisis of colonialism, which I didn't hear be, be mentioned yet in this panel and a crisis of democracy and of the precarization of our workers' lives. Um, so tying this all together and remembering that this is a moment for us to not go back to normal as Cindy mentioned, but, but to imagine, a to remember that Things that we thought that were so radical and so far away are already being fight, uh, being fought for and accomplished by our movements. So this is a, a moment for, to take us even further uh, in the fight for liberation. And, um, and we all know in our hearts that the solution for that is building truth, true solidarity and finding what that really means in a context of the US as well. Thank you, thank you, that was great. Um, you know, I forgot and and uh, so, you know, we just touched upon some of the work that we could do together as by example that uh, was just talked about, but we want to schedule another meeting uh, for us in the Pacific Northwest to try to brainstorm more ideas. And uh, that meeting will be May 9th at four o'clock, four o'clock to 5.30. And we will be sending out a notice to everyone to join us on that meeting. And I forgot to do one of the most important things, which is a fundraising pitch. Uh, and there is a slide up, as you can see, and not only to support expenses of putting on this webinar, but to continue to organize to end US sanctions and to build this Pacific Northwest network. Uh, as was mentioned, we some of us have worked together to bring various speakers from Cuba, from Honduras, um, and um, uh, Steve Elner to talk about Venezuela. Uh, but we want to do more work together. So checks can be made out to Lilo Legacy. Just you can use the acronym for Legacy of Equality Leadership and Organizing, and mail it uh, to that PO box where we accept Venmo as well. And that's that's up on the slide. Uh, we also uh, want to close with um, uh, just a, you know, that uh, in terms of demands, the, the broadest demand is to end all sanctions, end all US sanctions, and especially in this period, to unfreeze the financial financial assets and bank accounts of targeted countries so that they can purchase and receive the necessary food, medicine, and medical equipment and supplies needed to combat this pandemic. And to end the war against these countries that are fighting, trying to save people's lives in this pandemic. Uh, and in particular, to Venezuela, 
to drop the baseless charge of drug trafficking against President Nicolas Maduro and other officials of the government of Venezuela. We call on the Secretary General of the United Nations for a global ceasefire. War has to end, ceasefire must be called. We need peace in this, in this world. We need every person on board to fight this ep epidemic, this pandemic, and to save lives. So thank you all for coming today. We hope to see you next Saturday as we continue to discuss uh, how we can build this network. I wanna thank all the speakers today, especially Dan for bearing with us and, and speaking with us today and helping to educate us here in the Northwest and buy his book, No More War, which just came out. Uh, and we hope to see you again, Dan, and hope that you can speak to us again with a much more bigger audience to learn about um, the wars that are going on in this country and the impact of of sanctions. Thank you all. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, thank you Aline. And thank you, Barry, for moderating uh, this session.